Um, so thank you very much for coming along. Um, basically, how the format of the event should run is that uh, we've got uh, three presentations from four people. Uh, we've asked them not to overrun seven minutes. Um, we'll uh, get them to, we hope, provoke you into a, some kind of uh, discussion. Uh, we'd love you to post questions in the chat. Um, we've, we've got sort of um, open chat. You can send a direct message to someone if you insist, uh, like if you wanted to flirt with each other. But what we really like is the idea of questions which are in the open space because, you, you know, someone might uh, see a question and say, oh, God, that one's a bit banal. I can, I can ask my um, banal question as well, which is what we want to encourage. We want to encourage everyone to post questions. Uh, and then some of you might actually have the answer to some of these questions, so if you could, uh, put those in as well. Now, there's a nasty squidgy noise in the background, so if someone can mute themselves, uh, that would be great. Um, that would be helpful. Uh, okay. Sally. I think it's Sally who uh, needs to be muted back. I'm not sure. Sally, can you mute yourself? Dan, well done. That's fantastic. Okay, so uh, we'll we'll get started. Although we're we're a bit short on the numbers, we got people who actually bought tickets and haven't turned up yet. But we'll get going. Uh, first off, um, in the room are uh, Babak, Gert, and myself. Uh, we are uh, the three core volunteers who put Soundwalk September together. Um, we also have a platform called Walk, Listen, Create, for which most of you will have had to have registered to get hold of uh, a ticket and to get into the room. Um, the um, Walk, Listen, Create and Soundwalk September is all about celebrating Soundwalks and, and getting people to try to make Soundwalks. And um, you can guess from the um, uh, ticket sales, we're, we're not making a huge mint out of this. So. What we have uh, got are four panelists who've given up their time um, and they're going to offer their experience and advice. Um, and we're going to gift them a book. And that's, uh, we're really generous. They, right. they, get share one, they get one book each, but, uh, uh, and that's about all we can afford really. Uh, but the good news is we can afford a uh, hardback book for each of them because this event has been sponsored by Echoes. Now, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Echoes, um, Echoes are an uh, app developer. And uh, they've created a fantastic app. And uh, so we're going to tell you a little bit about that to begin with. So Echoes specializes in geolocative audio. Uh, they have a free and open access platform at echoes.xyz or xyz. Uh, which allows creators to make and publish incredible GPS triggered walking experiences. They also design bespoke apps which focus on sound and location, including the Royal Parks and the Royal Academy's collaborative Music for Trees app, if any of you have come across that, and uh, I hope you have. The great news is that one of our panelists is a huge enthusiast of Echo, so I didn't really need to give Echoes a plug at all, because they'll get a plug throughout. Okay, so uh, next up, who are our guests? Uh, very quickly from me, uh, they have uh, over 70 years experience in the world of sound. Um, and many of them have been miking up all sorts of people in studios but they haven't actually been making sound walks for anything like as long. So, uh, you know, they've been learning a little bit about going outside and dealing with ambient sounds and uh, how you make all these things work. But one thing's for sure, they probably know a lot more than we do. So uh, we really want to get everything out of them tonight. So what we've asked them to do is to, um, speak for seven minutes uh, at maximum each, uh, and they will be playing some clips. And how this will work is they're going to uh, put a URL link in the chat and invite you to click on that link and then go and listen to a clip. And then what we hope is that you'll come back um, to this uh, project, uh, discussion and, and get, uh, get involved back in the discussion. Um, so first up is going to be John Beecham. And John, 
Uh, I'm going to read his little bio, which he uh, had on the website. Um, he'll probably tell you a little bit more about himself as well. But first off, John is a Polish-British independent audio producer uh, based in Warsaw. Uh, he was the English desk editor at Polish Radio, and he's worked with radio stations in Poland, as well as across Europe and beyond. He works with the Adam Mikovic uh, Institute and Culture.pl to make geolocated sound walks in Warsaw. And in early 2020, he formed Free Range Productions, one of Poland's first fully independent audio documentary and storytelling companies. John, over to you. Okay, uh, many thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, it's uh, Adam Mickiewicz, it's uh, Poland's national bard. It's almost like the Shakespeare of Poland. So um, the institute I work for uh, is run and uh, sponsored, by, sponsored by the Polish Ministry of um, Culture and National Heritage and uh, our mission is to promote Polish culture abroad. So that by means of a very quick introduction, uh, we decided to make podcasts and sound walks uh, just to try and engage uh, people with Polish culture in a slightly different way. Um, Warsaw, not necessarily your top tourist destination, uh, but it is a city full of uh, hidden histories. Uh, and of course, you know, cities such as London um, and other, you know, great cities across the world, you know, buildings do tell a tale. Uh, but when you get authoritarian regimes that want to basically uh, plug their own version of history um, and impose their worldview on people, they do all sorts of things. So what they did after the Second World War was uh, they flattened Warsaw, uh, 50 hectares of urban fabric, so streets, buildings, you name it, it was all raised to the ground and a massive um, palace was built, it's called the Palace of Culture and uh, Science, uh, and it was a so-called gift from uh, Stalin to the Polish people in the 1950s. Um, but before the war, uh, you know, you have all these streets and all these, uh, and all these buildings, and what goes with that? You have uh, you have personal histories, you have histories of companies, um, and in the end, I wanted to produce uh, a sound walk which really unearthed the unseen, what basically hidden histories underneath the cobblestones, because the Palace of Culture only takes up a little bit of this, and then all the way around, you have the this square called Parade Square. It's one of Europe's largest open spaces. And uh, it's absolutely dreadful in the summer because there are no trees on it and it all heats up and it's all pretty, pretty ghastly. Um, so in, the, in, in making a sound walk, um, I wanted to, uh, you know, make it up of a number of episodes, concentrate on a number of addresses which don't exist anymore. And of course, this is where Echoes comes in uh, because it is geolocative and GPS triggered. The onus was on me to find where these places were, so I had to get an old map and overlay it on a new map of the square and simply walk to these places and roughly think, OK, this is going to be here. Uh, and this is where, you know, I was just really kind of uh, looking on Google Maps and then putting down the like the, the pin just to make sure I wouldn't lose the place. Um, and then I would record uh, binaural atmos, so ambience around the, uh, of, of the Warsaw we hear today, uh, and then we would, um, and then I wanted to create various narrative layers on top of that. So it is a sound walk, but you can listen to it over iTunes or Spotify and all the other distribution channels. Um, so uh, the three main different kinds of sounds which I was really aiming for were uh, witness accounts. Um, and this is one of the first sounds that I'm going to play you. One of the addresses, Marszalkowska 109, uh, is um, an address which had a chocolate shop, a Vedel chocolate shop. Now, Emil Vedel was uh, the chocolate baron of the interwar Poland. Um, he was so uh, rich and so amazing with marketing that he even had a plane to, you know, fly across Warsaw and even up to the Baltic Sea to kind of tell people, and the Germans at the time, uh, because it was only Danzig or Gdańsk now, uh, which was in uh, barely in Polish hands, but it was a free city. But he would fly up there and uh, basically tell the whole world to buy his chocolate. Uh, and he even uh, was going to start selling in New York, but uh, the Second World War put a, put a, a stop to that. Um, I actually managed to get a hold of 
uh, Mr. Fedel's uh, granddaughter, uh, Mrs. Uh, Elżbieta Yashinska, who uh, speaks in beautiful English about how chocolate tastes. I know that the, that the quality of those chocolates before the war was very high. I mean, I used to remember people telling me when I was a child, now we can't imagine the taste of a Vedel chocolate. Um, so here we have uh, Mrs. Elżbieta Yashinska talking about how Vedel chocolate is basically amazing. Uh, she does actually say quite a few other things in the episode, but I just wanted to give you a taster, uh, uh, sorry about the pun, um, about uh, Polish interwar chocolate. And of course, you're standing in the place where the shop used to stand. So I use all different kinds of effects, like, you know, the doorbell and you're, when you're walking into the shop and all the rest of it. Um, and you get this personal account of her family selling chockey, which I think is absolutely great. There is a British connection here because... Uh, I think uh, Cadbury's is now made by Vedel in Poland, uh, but that's uh, another story. Um, moving swiftly on, because I know we are short of time and I'm very scared that Babak's going to cut me off. Um, apart from getting witness accounts, I was really uh, keen on tapping into archives. Now, I thoroughly recommend anyone who is going into soundwalks, especially kind of history based soundwalks like the one I made uh, in Warsaw, uh, is to try and get as many uh, archive sounds as possible. Of course, if you're in a country which is not English speaking, that might be hard if you're trying to cater for an English speaking audience. Um, but you would be surprised. Um, I managed to tap into the History Meeting House uh, archives. Now, this is a, an organization um, sponsored by the city of Warsaw, which collects oral histories about the city. So here I didn't manage to get any sounds in English, but from the National Digital Archive, um, so we're talking kind of top level um, archive, I did manage to find sounds in English. And in one episode uh, from Marszokowska 117, I think it is, so uh, further down the same street, uh, we have a, a cafe called Cafe Fog. Now, um, Fog was an incredibly popular interwar Polish uh, singer, and he sang during the war, and in fact during the uprising as well, to keep people, um, you know, on their on their toes and to keep morale high. After the war, of course, you know, there wasn't that much singing going on, but he did open a cafe, and people flocked back to the city um, after the Second World War, looking for their loved ones, and they would put up uh, signs in the windows. Uh, I also managed to speak with his great grandson. Um, who actually turns out to live uh, the floor above me in the flat I live uh, now, which is, you know, also handy. Um, but here we go. I'm going to, going to show you now that the next link, which I've just put in the chat, is uh, an archive recording of a group of Swedish journalists who came to Warsaw in the summer of 1945. And this is an original uh, recording uh, in English. Uh, they did the same in Swedish as well, but they did the same in English for posterity. So uh, take a listen. There are moments in life when words become meaningless, the language poor, when you think it's better to say nothing than too little, when you are afraid of giving false expressions of your feelings and thoughts. When we Swedes nowadays, after six years, are able to visit the capital of Poland, I think that all of us feel the same paralyzation in front of the brutal, stubborn fact. Myself, I couldn't at first trust the witness on my own eyes, and I know that my efforts to express my first impressions of Warsaw have been convulsive. Of course, the confrontation with Warsaw will have a much stronger effect upon people who have been living in a country that has not been drawn into the war. We have not seen the horrors of war, occupation and tyranny, but at a distance. And I'm quite aware that many of the things now exciting us at the first sight, the Polish people have already incorporated with their definite experience of life. I've seen the destruction of Hamburg, Kiel, and some other towns in Europe. And I've read about and tried to imagine how Warsaw looked like. Before I came here, I was prepared for the worst. But I must say that no human fantasy can beforehand paint the face of Warsaw of today, although I realize that it must have been much worse immediately after the liberation, and that many things have changed for the better since then. Okay, um, and uh, now I'm 
pretty much sure that Bamak will cut me off because I've gone way over time. Um, so I'm going to cut with the other sound uh, and I won't play it to you. Needless to say, um, there is another place on the on Parade Square which was part of the Jewish ghetto run by Janusz Korczak who was a Jewish, um, a, he was an educator, extremely popular even nowadays. His, uh, his um, pedagogical methods are still used here in Poland. Um, and he didn't want to leave his kids um, in 1943 when, they, uh, when the liquidation of the ghetto happened. Um, and he went with his children to the Umschlagplatz, which is a kilometer north of, of Parade Square. Um, and he was taken to uh, Treblinka and immediately gassed the next day. Uh, and here, of course, we can't have any witness statements, um, but you can also use historians to explain what is going on and that the orphanage was in the square. So um, in a very, very quick way, I wanted to basically show the different kinds of sounds you can incorporate into a sound walk. It doesn't have to be simple narration. It doesn't have to be one person basically telling you what you're looking at. Um, you can actually use different uh, different ways to uh, try and you know create an image because we are listening to the sound uh, and it's obviously very good to kind of be in the place and see what you see, you know, what is there now. But when you have nothing to see, you have to conjure up the images on your own. So um, this is what I tried to do. Um, and uh, that is Unseen. Uh, that is the first series of Unseen uh, that was released last year. This year, I released uh, two uh, editions of the second season uh, in both English and in Polish about the Warsaw Uprising, which took place in from August to October 1944, um, and that's also, it's not as uh, sound rich as the first season, um, but yeah, of course, if you do come to Poland, do, do give it a go. Uh, many thanks to all of you for listening. Do I get a virtual clap now, or how does this work? Uh, what, what one does is one twinkles or sprinkles, I like sort of silent applause. Okay, brilliant, thank you very much, John. Okay, so next up My is... Uh, is next up is Martin Eccles. But what I want to make sure of is we get some questions going. So maybe you want to ask a question and put it in the chat. Uh, I think definitely uh, looking at how you get permissions uh, to use all this kind of material. Uh, maybe looking at how uh, you know when you set it up. Do you do you think about composing it first? Do you do you go off and research or what you're looking for, John, or do you know? Uh, do you write a script to it? You know all this kind of stuff. Um, those... the thing, it, it is very much scripted. Uh, I don't want you. To, I don't want you to answer those. Those are just me. Okay. Okay, okay. 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 Well, come back to questions at the end. So it's over to Martin Eccles. Uh, an introduction to Martin. Uh, Martin is a walking sound artist and poet. He lives in Newcastle upon Tyne, uh, in the northeast of England. And his practice aims to reflect the experience of his presence in and walking through natural environments. He uses a range of methods, uh, predominantly sound and text, to respond to time, distance, place in the landscape. And uh, his walks explore time through a number of methods, such as replicated walks, durational walks, Cajun walks, and walks that challenge his senses. Now, he's also uh, made solo radio broadcasts in 2018 and 19, and has had a 24 episode radio series and the broadcast of a continuous 24 hour walk or work. I beg your pardon, Martin, a 24 hour work. So over to you, Martin. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, this is very exciting to be able to talk to you about what I do. Um, slightly differently to John, um, what I'm going to be doing is giving you a verbal description of what I do. And I'm going to post some links in the chat, but I, these aren't for you to necessarily access during this podcast. So you might want to copy them and put them somewhere else if you're interested in following them up. And if that is not technically possible, if uh, you're interested and want to get access to them, uh, then if you contact either me or Andrew Babak or Hirt, we can provide you with access to what I'm going to post. 
Um, so, in general, I take the approach that my movement is a central part of what I present, and I would regard this as an embodied phenomenological position. Um, a caveat, what I'm going to describe to you may suggest that uh, what I produce are apparently discrete works which are very well ordered and offer a coherent view of what I do. The reality is much less structured and much more iterative. Uh, there can be long periods of time between making a set of walk recordings and what I then compose with them. And the act of recording one work may trigger a reevaluation of an earlier piece. Um, I've just popped into the chat uh, a couple of websites, one's my SoundCloud account, one's my website, and pretty much everything I'm going to talk about is accessible through one or other of those links. Um, Andrew said in the introduction uh, that I have three, um, I can think of my work in at least three broad categories. Uh, I'm very interested in um, the work of John Cage, and have done a series of walks where the locations to which I walk and what I record whilst doing so is driven by the play of chance. Um, I devise the process and then I walk and record the consequences of it. Um, I just realised that I said I put something in the chat and I forgot to hit return. <laughs> which isn't great if I'm trying to tell you stuff. Um, so uh, the chance walking URLs have just gone in. Now I've actually worked out how to use the chat properly. Uh, the next body of work is about repetitions through and of time. I'm interested in time, presenting time, condensing time, reimagining time. And um, I've done uh, overall about nine pieces of work which um, together uh, examine uh, my ability to play with time. And the final ones were um, representations of time and place. Um, and this was the work that Andrew referred to, which uh, resulted in a 24-hour duration radio piece, um, which was uh, really quite good fun just to think about. Um, I often end up making these works on islands. Some of these are large such as Iceland. Uh, some of them are very small, um, Biana Ray in the Outer Hebrides, Papa Westray in Orkney. Uh, most of my islands are real, um, but some are imaginary. Um, I have at least two imaginary islands on the go at the moment. Um, I will say something about the technical elements of what I do because um, uh, uh, the answer to your question, Andrew, how long does it take to make a sandbox 24 hours long? 24 days is the answer. Um, I present the work in different ways. The, one of the most interesting ways for me to present the work is through multi-channel sound installations where I can take a space and multiple speakers and uh, move the sound around and move the listener around within the space and within the sound. One of the really nice things about this is that it involves the audience, the listeners, in an act of co-creation and what they're actually hearing. Uh, I've done, as um, Andrew said in the introduction, works for broadcast in various ways, shapes and forms. And these um, impose more of a structure on the work. Um, I inevitably have to shorten it. Um, there's usually a prescribed duration to a radio broadcast, and within that, I end up needing to make decisions about things like sequence, transitions, durations. Um, in the installation pieces, 
I'm making quite a lot of use of layering of sound and the act of layering is more difficult to control within, for me, within the stereo presentation of a radio broadcast. The final thing that I do uh, which complements the sound is my poetry and it sits both within and alongside the sound pieces and it offers a different way of presenting some of the same ideas um, though it has the potential to add additional dimensions often small um, uh, detailed detail if you can have detailed detail of the visual the format of presentation is an integral part of the poetry and i use a range of formats concertina fold books uh, what are called scripta continua um, or they can be read i read the works as an embodied act within the sound recording um, the technical stuff may be what um, you want to actually ask about um, and i just put some details of what I actually use uh, in the chat. Basically, the important thing for me is that mobility is central to everything that I do. And what I do and the way that I do it um, has evolved over a period of years to allow me to walk um, normally, safely and alone. Um, I've given you some details of the kit I use, the recorders, the microphones, the powering and the editing software. Uh, I see that from the chat, John likes Reaper. Um, I love Reaper. Um, and uh, the just as I finish, what I'll do is, although I don't have any technical visuals that kit looks like this so this is the business end of my recording setup this is a broad brimmed hat uh, there you have four microphones that will produce a quadraphonic recording i can take anything i want from that i can take it down to mono stereo um, but equally i by using ambisonic plugins i can diffuse that uh, around a space should i so wish to do that um, and uh, i've given you details of the recorders they will all cope with a uh, four mic input and um andrew that's pretty much where I wanted to leave it for now. I would be delighted to um, respond to questions uh, as we move through. Okay, well, that's fantastic. I think, first of all, we'll give you, a, 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 you know, the silent applause. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was uh, a man with a hat is always going to be a man who gets ahead, as they say. <laughs> um, but um, I don't know what uh, uh, women on this, um, Room. All our presenters are male, and we all felt a bit bad about this. And uh, so we're uh, certainly expecting some uh, responses from the women in the room as well. So uh, we'd uh, love to know how you uh, wear your kit if you're going on a sound walk, and uh, you know what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. I must say, a man with four fuzzy things on his head must be a, a strange sight indeed. So, okay, next up is um, a, a double act. We've actually got Jeremy Evans and Andy Fell. They're going to sort of present at the same time, or hopefully they're not going to talk over each other. Uh, anyway, they are part of the team that produced BBC Radio 3's um, Slow Radio. Uh, they both worked on something called the Arctic Sound Walk, um, which some of you, if you were in the UK, might well have listened to last Christmas. Um, between them, they've got uh, uh, well over 40 years of uh, working of uh, miking up musicians and uh, um, getting involved with classical music uh, inside. Um, and uh, so they know all about that, and I'm sure they'd uh, be able to rig up a room very, very rapidly. But um, what we need to know is what they've learnt when they've uh, traipsed around outside. 
And um, so it's going to be over to Jeremy to uh, follow on. Okay, well, hello. Uh, nice to, to see everybody here. Um, and Andy is here as well. And we will just give you a little bit about ourselves before we start talking about um, what we did, what was for both of us our, our first sound walk. I think that's right, isn't it, Andy? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I've been at the BBC for a long time and I've worked across national and local radio. And uh, I'm currently an editor at BBC Radio 3, looking after several of the, uh, the, the station's main strands. Um, but I've also worked in local radio. I've done all sorts of things. And made, you know, my main bread and butter is working in classical music and making classical music programmes. Um, but what I love doing and what I've loved doing all the time that I've been making programmes is getting listeners into the outdoors and, and, and using music to bring a landscape alive uh, for listeners. So what I particularly enjoy is that interplay of music and landscapes. Um, Andy, what about you? Um, yeah, so similar to Jeremy, um, my background is rooted in classical um, music recording. Um, the way that we're staffed at Radio 3 is that rather than bring in freelancers to kind of um, supply a particular project in terms of technical staff, we tend to look to our in-house team. And the Sandwalks were a fairly new concept um, for Radio 3 when they started a few years ago. Um, what that meant for me was that I was uh, faced with having to adapt the techniques that I had been um, working with for many years in the classical uh, recording um, sphere to um, the outdoors. Um, and as someone who had previously spent a, a, a lot of time um, outside going on, um, you know, camping trips and the hikes, that sort of thing, um, that was definitely a pretty exciting um, thing to be faced with and I think we'll talk more uh, we'll talk more about um, oh hello dogs um, well I think we'll um, talk more about that um, as we get on with this yeah is everyone is everyone seeing the screen sharing by the way uh, yeah good yeah <laughs> so so we'll, we'll scroll through some pictures of, of what we did um, with, with this sound walk and the the idea was that we, we wanted to go somewhere incredibly remote we made ended up making three one and a quarter hour programmes that went out over Christmas last year. And we really just wanted to bring that the, to life, that, that stark beauty of the, of the Arctic tundra, um, along with Horatio Clare, who has, has, has done the, the previous sound walks. And we walked along the Arctic Circle Trail. Um, it was a 40 mile walk. And uh, we took three days in October to do it. Um, when you know when there wasn't any snow there uh, which was 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 particularly helpful and it's one of the one of the classic hikes of, of the world um but these were programs that i mean my job i suppose was to to try and pull the whole thing together to 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 work out the planning and and get the thing started get get it out there andy recorded it as we walked and then i came back and, uh, and and turned it into into three radio programs um and there were challenges when we got there weren't there andy uh there were challenges but there were also plenty of very fortuitous fortuitous events um i mean certainly i, I, I in this kind of challenges list was um, I think the day we were supposed to be leaving or possibly the evening before we found out that our polar bear guard who our BBC safety colleagues had insisted we had with us um, was cancelling on us because he was going to go hunting instead um, and Jeremy was remarkably unfazed by this fact and just duly found us another one within a matter of minutes um, but in the list of things that went very well as you can see um, a pair of very fine looking huskies, um, they emerged out of the tundra within seconds of us starting this three day hike and actually accompanied uh, us for the whole three days, providing us with a completely unexpected um, storytelling element uh, to the sound walk and some pretty interesting sounds as well. I think I'm going to have to stop sharing my, my screen to be able to uh, post the, the link to the sounds. Um, but before I do that, um, what, um, 
what we're thinking about all the time, um, I suppose in the setup and whilst we're out there recording this stuff and when we get home and sit in front of it, we, we, we chop it all up on, on Sadie. Um, but it's what on earth is that narrative that's going to take the listener through? What is it that's going to, what's going to make them comfortable, but also give them enough to, to surprise them and keep them listening? And we were incredibly lucky in that these dogs just appeared out of the blue. Um, we had the story about the polar bear that we were trying to, to not meet. Um, we've got the hunter who, who was a character, even though we didn't speak any Greenlandic and he didn't speak any English, he was still this unspoken character in this slow, expansive story. Um, but look, I'll share with you now the, um, the link to the opening of the, uh, of the programmes, I can make this work, um, which is where Horatio um, meets, the, um, meets the Huskies. So it should be there for you now. Running Husky. <laughs> They're pups. Four Husky pups. They're really, really friendly five. They're appearing out of this granite landscape. Like small spirits, wagging their tails and sniffing like mad. Here they come. A white one, three black ones, and one bandit with a black face mask. Hello. Oof. The husky's very communicative. Hello. Where have you all broken out from then? One of them's trailing an orange lead. <laughs> Where are you supposed to be? You're just young ones allowed to run around. Absolutely charming. Like the small bears. Hello. What's next then? More running. Oh, hello. Slightly wary of me. Maybe I smell odd. Not Greenlandic enough. Oh, very friendly though. Completely adorable. Would you like to come on a small walk? We're walking along the Arctic Circle Trail. You're very welcome. Oh. Come on then, let's go. Let's just nick five huskies. Where are you supposed to be? Is that your house down there? You can just do what you want, really. So yeah, as these huskies probably know perfectly well, this trail is about 100 miles long. We saw, um, we, we saw Martin's hat um, with his microphones on. Um, and so here's a picture you should be able to uh, see, I hope, of, um, of the kit that Panda used uh, to pick up some of the sounds. And let's say we had the, the huskies, but we're also particularly lucky with the other wildlife that came our way that included uh, ravens and also geese that we might be able to have a listen to shortly. Do you want to talk about your kit, Andy? Um, I can do, just conscious of time. Um, I should add that that bag mostly contains camping stuff because um, as opposed to sound equipment. <laughs> but nevertheless, it was a considerably less lean rig than, um, um, yes, uh, than the hat. Um, yeah, that's a slightly, uh, slightly, slightly better shot. Um, so, um, I mean, very briefly, um, it's actually, funnily enough, um, the same recorder. Um, so it's a, a Mix Pre 6, which was chosen because it's exceptionally light. Um, on the next trip, which we're hoping will happen fairly shortly, I'll be taking the sound devices um, alternative, which is the 7888. Um, and that's a pair of um, DPA 4006 um, mics, uh, which are very similar to the small ones. Um, they just have slightly bigger signal to noise ratio. So you can kind of um, um, just hear those very, very faint sounds ever so, with uh, ever so slightly uh, less nuanced settings, if you see what I mean. You just kind of almost set it and forget it. Um, and they're incredibly um, uh, rugged. Uh, there are two currently on their way to Mars. 
um, on a NASA mission. I think it's a NASA mission, possibly the European equivalent. Um, yeah, I, and I use them all the time in my classical recording work. Um, and after having experimented with various different microphone techniques, which I'm happy to talk about later, um, that's the one that I settled on. I'm, I'm very glad that I did. Okay, it um, it might be worth just talking about how we how we rigged ourselves up. So there was there was a man with the gun who was looking after us, uh, uh, Kayiok, walking at the front. Um, then Horatio, who was doing the talking into his microphone. Andy, who you were sort of linking us all together because you you, uh, you were able to hear what Horatio was saying uh, via radio, and I came up at the back, sort of um, making sure everybody walked. Yeah, yeah. So, so, um, so this was this was uh, one way in which our trip differed from Martin's um, works uh, um, in the sense that um, we had two people to mic up: me holding the ambience mics, uh, but then also Horatio independently um, doing his own uh, narration. So um, we needed a way of hearing each other, and Jeremy needed to be able to hear us in order to make notes for editing later. So that was all done over Wi-Fi frequencies using um, road uh, road link. Um, packs um his horatio's local um output was transmitted um to uh, me uh, which i recorded as a kind of backup uh, and then my ambience mics and that mixed with horatio was was then sent back to jeremy over a similar system so it was quite it was kind of fiddly um but it meant that Je that horatio could be some distance ahead of us which was important because we uh, it was important that he was only picked up very minimally, if at all, uh, on my mics, um, so that the editing process could be made much easier. And this, look, this, this, this was a, it was a big production. We were incredibly fortunate to be able to, to go. And um, I guess if we were doing smaller scale stuff, we wouldn't have this, this sort of technical setup. We were, we were lucky to be able to, to, to do it in this way. Um, I wonder if it's worth just having listened to to the wind, Andy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because I mean, this was a real test of our technical kit because it was absolutely fierce. Uh, the the wind. I was almost knocked off my feet at one point. Okay, so here's here's the link for it. Well, if you were to be parachuted into this valley, you wouldn't know where you were. It could be the Hindu Kush. It could definitely be the High Atlas. Savage rocks on either side. The wind coming straight down it. Just the three huskies might give it away. The rocks have a greenish tinge, and the vegetation is suddenly very sparse indeed. Low-lying, clinging on. It does feel like a proper polar rude wind. Yeah, it's strong up here. Coming straight off the ice cap, which is four times the size of California. Although it doesn't feel it now, it broke records this summer. There were days when 95% of the surface was melting. And it was the single biggest... From I mean, I think we set out you know, we, we've got we've got big audiences on Radio Three, and it was it was it was made for a general audience, and rather than a rather than a specialist audience. And you know, whilst we're thinking about that narrative and and how we kept them, it was also about mood, and it was made with that particular time of year in mind as well. It going out over Christmas, so we use those soundscapes and the narrative. And the music, and and layered it, and mixed it together to create those particular moods. And um, yeah, I think you know, 
it worked it worked all right and hopefully we're heading off up to um uh, across the um the four high peaks of the uk um in, in the coming couple of weeks to do another one for for this christmas so that's us i think isn't it Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK, so uh, we've got some questions in the chat. That's good. But I want to um, first give the uh, the panelists a chance to uh, uh, ask questions of each other a little bit. But uh, I'm going to start because I'm, you know, I'm the chair and I can get away with this kind of stuff and uh, and uh, and ask my questions. So, um, and I have sort of given them a prior warning that I was going to ask this, but what I'm interested in is while you're doing whatever you're doing, what do you keep in mind? What do you, what do you have to keep in mind? And it's very easy when you're, you've done these things a few times to sort of um, be almost sort of nonchalant about it. But for us uh, who uh, might be thinking about contemplating and making a sound walk, what kind of things do we need to keep going? So I'm, I'm just guessing that Andy probably has to remember about battery power and uh, switching things on. And, and John might be up to something that he's also thinking about. So uh, we'll start with that. So if, if you could have a quick soundbite at answering what to keep in mind, uh, may, maybe start with Andy and, uh, and go, go in reverse, Andy, Jeremy, Martin and John. And, and then uh, we'll have a couple of questions uh, from the chat and then uh, invite the panelists if they want to ask questions. Of the uh, of the of the audience, and um, we'll, we'll start with everyone muted. But I, there, there are not so many of us in the room, so we might be daring and unmute you all. Um, uh, it's really up to you, uh, but mind your your background noise. But first of all, Andy, what what do you keep in mind? What's the sort of um, well, I suppose it's a combination of things that I should have in mind and things that I shouldn't. In the sense that. Um, I, I find I found that my mind kept wandering because I was just having such a nice time and I was listening to what Horatio was saying um, and listening to it kind of as a radio program, but just a really very, very long one, completely unedited. Um, but what I should have been focusing on and was certainly focusing on much of the time was all of the countless things that could go wrong to jeopardise what I was attempting to do. Um, to a certain extent, that was battery life, um, although I took very high capacity batteries with me and actually they lasted very well. Um, the main problem that I encountered was just spurious noises and rattles, um, which could come from anywhere at any time and emerge from seemingly, um, you know, innocuous places, you know, a part of your equipment that you didn't think could rattle could suddenly start rattling after two days and you'd have to find it, tape it down. Um, that was really the battle. It was kind of acoustic noise uh, rather than anything electronic. Um, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, you're, um, you're, well, well, either when you're out there walking or when you're back in the studio uh, doing the edits, what's, uh, what, what's, what do you keep in mind? <laughs> I, th I think both, uh, whether, whether I'm out there walking, making whatever program it is, or whether I'm in the studio, um, it's um, it's having it's almost having the listener on your shoulder, um, and having your sort of thinking, of what can they what can they see? Um, that's what I, that's what I'm thinking all the time. How is this going to work on the radio? How is what's just been said going to work as an edit? What can I do with that sound? Um, yeah, and that's that's what I'm thinking all the time in the field and back in the in the edit. And do we need to retake? Do we need to go back and do whatever? Is there something squeaking, as Andy says? And 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 I'm assuming that you're taking copious notes while you're doing the walk, so that when you're back in the in the studio, you kind of remember which bits were amazing and which bits were. Super yeah, yeah, I was. So I was walking, and I, I got a notebook and noting down with the time code exactly what had been said at what point. Um, and and do you, was, when, yeah, you've done it as a notebook. You don't GPS it. You don't put it on a, a note and then have it linked to a GPS so that you know exactly where on the walk it was. You don't do that. Uh, no, we didn't. I suppose we could have done. Um, but it was it was it's fantastic to go back because I can't remember how many hours we've got. It must have it must have been forty hours almost that we we got massive stuff. But to be able to and you, to be able to find it exactly was 
it was, it was brilliant and that's what that's what allowed us to to turn that sort of that amount of material around i think okay martin your turn do you do you, do you worry about a listener or are you just making art you know is it well what, what's your and, and and what do you keep in mind while you're making your work um it's a really interesting question and um it's fascinating for me to contrast um what i think i do because in a fine art department people don't often ask you questions like that um the um things i'm not thinking about often uh, is anything technical basically by the time i start by the time i start walking i don't want to think about the kit um, that does create problems, and as I said in one of the posts in the chat, I mean, I agree with Andy about batteries, um, and it has taken me a while to settle on the battery setup that I now have. And that, so far, touch wood, that has been reliable. Um, but I don't, so what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about the artistic idea. I'm thinking about whatever it was I set out to do. If it's a Cajun walk, it's about where I'm going from and to, and about where I'm going to be stopping. If it's a replicated walk, it's about the number of replicates, when I get to eat, how long I've got to rest, the physical demands of the act that I'm presenting. Um, so the, um, although my kit has evolved over a period of six years, um it's when i'm actually out i don't want to think about it it's got to work and um i have the microphones on my hat where i can't see them and can't touch them um i either carry the uh the mix pre in the top of a rucksack uh lid pocket or hung slung from a harness from the straps of a rucksack where I can see it's a little bit more in the way when I do that it's much nicer if I can just get it out of the way the problem with that is it is out of sight out of mind I can't see it I don't monitor as I said in the chat I can't wear that hat and wear headphones uh, so I've never I mean my practice has never involved monitoring while I'm actually recording uh, and usually I don't end up doing a lot in post-production. Um, I, I, I have settled on um, recording levels which generally work. So anything except the kit is what I think about. Okay, great. Okay, and John, your turn. What, what do you keep in mind? Uh, much like Andy, um, having worked in just general radio work, it's just batteries, 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 batteries. I mean, like, you can never have enough batteries. It's just simple as that. I was, uh, the first series of Unseen, I was recording on uh, a Marantz uh, PMD661. So, like, the kind of, br is a kind of proper brick, which takes four AAs, and it, they, they'll just drain within a couple of hours of recording. Uh, luckily now I do everything on a mix pre three with uh, with an L mount as well. So like I've got some proper kind of uh, kind of rather large batteries actually. They're kind of hard to fit in anywhere. But then I know that I can go for six to eight hours with of continuous recording, and I don't really have to worry about it. Uh, but yeah, batteries uh, and also SD cards actually, or memory cards or anything like that. That's also crucial. Um, and obviously when I was recording in Warsaw, yeah, just try and rec I mean I was recording Atmos in a very busy part of town so just watch the levels basically uh, for your microphones I was using for the first series uh, a set of um, Soundman binaural uh, ear like uh, they're, they're microphones but they're earphones you you put them in your ears uh, I'm sure like uh, lots of people here have heard of them or maybe have used them um, they're really good fun but also they are uh, fairly, um, how do you say it, fragile. Yeah, so you like, you can't really knock them around a bit. Um, 
so yeah, those are the kind of three main things. Um, and uh, if I go back to the very beginning, I remember um, Andrew, you were asking some questions. Well, what I, I mean, the thing which I was doing was that like I was actually recording, the getting the script first, but also basing the script on the archival sounds that I could get to begin with. So it was a kind of just everything at once, like a hodgepodge. See what came out. Great. Okay. And that's so all I have to say. Okay, let's have some questions from the chat. We've got um, uh, Jules Horn. Um, you you actually asked a question um, uh, about uh, the uh, Arctic Trail. Uh, would you like to ask that question or explore that a little bit? Jules, are you there? You need to unmute yourself. Yes, hi. Consciousness might not be great mic quality. Apologies. Um, yeah, I was interested in um, what you went into the situation with and um, and about shape and what you were looking for and whether there was a sense of sort of dramaturgy to how you how you shaped it. You said mood piece and I just wondered how you we were thinking about it structurally going in. And then you had the amazing dog incident happen. So I just wondered what was the interplay between shape um, because presumably, you know, pitching an idea, you've got to give some, some, some sense of that, some sense of the journey, and and then and just just how it worked for you, and yeah, was well, there a, was the, was the dynamic built into the relationship as well? Did you? Um, I've I've heard of um, somebody doing a, a a tour of the of the islands in a boat, and they decided that the relationship had a certain dynamic. The sailor um, was more um, competent, for example, than the, the than the newbie, and they they created they built a dynamic in that helped them to shape it. I just wondered about whether you you had you did something like that. Yeah, there were there were some things that we there were some things that we. Um, were planned. Uh, we knew that the walk would take three days, and we knew it was going to, it was going to be three programs. So that gave us a nice structure. Uh, each day ended up as a program. Um, I've got a sense of what sort of mood I wanted to create because I'd done quite a lot of research on music beforehand. So there was a particular piece of music that I wanted to use throughout the series, uh, which was a piece by John Luther Adams. Um, uh, which was written about uh, the the Arctic, um, and that had got a particular mood. As it happens, I mean, sometimes you can have that sort of mood in your head before you go. As it happened, the colours and everything ended up fitting, and, and 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 Horatio's narrative as well ended up fitting that music. Um, although we used lots of other bits of music to to shape and move things on and change the pace and 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 all of that sort of thing. Um, and then there was the stuff that we didn't know would happen. We, we didn't know these dogs would appear and create a narrative. But also we started out and Andy and I didn't really appear or we weren't referred to. And we weren't referred to throughout the whole programme or the whole series, but it became apparent. It, 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 Horatio stopped being an I and it started being we and us. So it just... You, everything developed so i think you can plan some things and then other stuff you can't work but it, it is of course it's about your relationship as a team as well i think you want to come back on that at all jules or not okay uh, uh, uh preta preta had a question about kit uh, but you saw, uh, also another question earlier on but preta would you like to choose a question you want to ask and you need to unmute yourself. Hi, yeah, I believe Martin already answered my question um, about how, uh, I asked a pandemic question, how are you making these hybrid installations with no indoor space? And he's using quad setup and that's rad. Um, so thank you. And then I asked Andy and Jeremy um, if they might share some details uh, about their kit and they did that. So they were prescient, at least with the mics. And yeah, basically you did share your kit info. So thanks for that. I'm all set. Yeah, yeah. would you like to tell us a little bit about wh why, what your interest is? I mean, that, are, you, are you about to make a sand walk or a purchase kit or you were just intrigued or you know, what, what area of work are you involved in? Um, so I uh, am making work right now about traumatic brain injury and um, 
that uh, what does what when uh, the entire body functions as an ear and I look to um, Alora and Caldazia's work um, it's particularly like um, the uh, it's the great embrace with Ted Chiang who uh, who did the script um, and they explore these kinds of um, issues like extinction or death um, I'm, I built my own mics to capture the sound of light and condensation. I'm trying to uh, sound out what fear and loss and nostalgia might be. Something Proustian, but for the ear. And I'm working, uh, the languages I'm using are English, American English, um, colonial English, Bengali, Hindi, French, and Tamil. Uh, these are my languages. Um, and it's about my mom. And uh, so it's a, uh, it used to be before the pandemic, it used to, it, it was taking shape as an actual walk-in installation where um, there is, it, it would be a sound walk, but you would be walking in my mother's brain. And that her, my mother's brain uh, lives equally in Calcutta as it does in Western Maryland, has spent time in Sydney as it has in Nairobi. And as you perambulate the space, or as you would have perambulated the space, your feet uh, would hit certain like blocks and the sound would rise up like a vortex. So you wouldn't be wearing headphones um, because that's not how my mom hears anymore because she has 23% of her brain. So I built this work uh, because my mother grew my ears inside of her. She was the first ocean I swam in. And now we swim differently. And, uh, but like, I don't know what to do now because of the pandemic. Yeah. So that's, that's a little about me. Wow, well, that's great. Well, that, that was really fascinating. So thank oh, you. Oh, wow, yeah. thanks. <laughs> that's good. I, I totally, I like, I spewed it out. I'm so nervous. I've totally sweated through my t-shirt. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry. Thanks. Well done. Okay. Well done. Uh, Babak, you had a question, um, or a couple even. What, 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 I'm not sure who they're aimed at. Is it at the panel as a whole, or is it individual? Um, you know, there are two general questions. Uh, but first, let me say, Prita, that I can't wait to hear your work. Uh, it sounds amazing. Um, so uh, <laughs> the two questions uh, I have, the first one is very practical. Um, uh, the um, uh, sounds I, I did not listen to the Radio 3 soundscapes of uh, Horatio and Andy and uh, Jeremy uh, when they were on the BBC because I don't live in the UK. Um, but they reminded me, the clips that we just listened to, very much of um, uh, a particular podcast that I do listen to. And the podcast is, I think, called Cities and Memory. And now my question is this. Do any of you have suggestions for podcasts? that convey a similar feeling as what the clips from the uh, sound walks on BBC Three um, reminded me of and what cities and memory is. Any suggestions from the panel? Any suggestions from the, uh, the uh, everyone, anyone in the room? Yeah. Hi, yes. Sorry, I unmuted myself. Is that all right? Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, okay, I don't know the rules. Um, it's not really a sound walk podcast like Oliveras or something like that, but it is a, it is a, it is like you know the Latin root of the word describe, discure means to walk. So it is Memory Palace, the podcast, and and you're probably very it. familiar with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, no, 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 it's great. It's a it's a wonderful recommendation. Uh, um, and then if you talk Memory Palace, then I also have to mention the Anthropocene Reviewed. It is also not a sound walk, but it is spectacular. And it's the narrative is a little bit like what Horatio uh, reminds me of as well in his talks. Uh, anyway. Um, there's one more thing. Actually, John and uh, Jenny, uh, remember when we were at Hearsay a couple of years ago and there was a guy, is his name Marco? Raffaele, the one who is using uh, geopolitical migrant uh, populations to do their sound walks of Rome. So temporary citizenship 
the trauma of geopolitical migrancy, and it's a little bit like Italo Calvino, invisible cities, because they're not even really visible to begin with, are they? When you're a geopolitical migrant, you're not visible. And so they are invisibly walking around Rome. Uh, I'll figure it out. Uh, you, uh, great. Yeah, thanks. But um, you guys any suggestions from the panel? Come on, panel. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind, unfortunately. Uh, okay, that's that's okay. I mean, that's, uh, I, mean I, will, I will say, yeah. Sorry. Well, no, I just wanted to say that, uh, especially when it comes to, let's say, promoting these kinds of things. I mean, it's very lucky that I work for a public institution. So, uh, even though it's nice to uh, to get some promotion, it's not a commercial project. Um, it's, it's paid for by tax, well, Polish taxpayers' money. So, um, I mean, obviously, it's good to promote it, and I have to promote it, and I did promote it um, as, as best as I could locally as well as abroad. Uh, but certainly, like, um, yeah, if you don't have to make money from these things, it's great. <laughs> they're, they're made because yeah. it simply takes that pressure off you. Yeah, and this also uh, ties into the second question that I had. Um, that is that uh, as uh, again the Ar the Arctic Soundwalk uh, on on BBC Radio showed uh, it showed that there is a huge potential market for this because it was if I understand it correctly immensely successful uh, slow radio right um, but at the same time uh, it's uh, commercially uh, very difficult um, so uh, my question to the panel is. Uh, do you see opportunities for making um, these slow radio or, or these soundscaping um, um, products, uh, do you see opportunities for making these more commercially viable? How to market this or how to sell this, how to uh, get more people to listen to these things? Uh, well, I'd, 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 if I could jump in, um, the only avenue that I had considered um, that might be open to that, thinking about the intrinsic role that the music played, as opposed to the actual location recordings in the work that we did, uh, was that maybe, um, you know, some of the companies who actually do have funding behind them, like Spotify, might look into um, uh, kind of having uh, a kind of actual, uh, a real narrative behind their kind of playlists, which are often just quite sort of dead things, really. But if um, playlists existed that could kind of weave the tracks in with the kind of work we did in the Arctic Circle, that might be one avenue. But nevertheless, you know, that's not that's not the same thing as making a standalone, um, uh, very very carefully considered piece in its own right. But they do have money, so yeah. Uh, Mark, yeah, they do have money. <laughs> Mark, do you have any thoughts on it or not? Um, no, not that are particularly helpful as someone whose radio efforts would fall firmly into the category of art radio. Um, uh, the the idea of of commercialization and sponsorship just never ever hoves into uh, my purview, so no, sorry. Uh, well, I'd like to pitch in because uh, I, I had a long discussion with Audible, um, and uh, Audible were telling us um, in discussions that um, the average uh, listening um, uh, for Audible, uh, people who subscribe to Audible, uh, is the average listening is 12 hours of, um, uh, of material. And so that they don't actually want to have the 45 minute Radio 3 drama, uh, they want uh, Vanity Fair or, uh, or, or whatever, you know, they, they want to have uh, long form, long pieces, and that they are beginning to um, uh, commission drama, but drama over a very long uh, duration. So that's kind of interesting that um, uh, they, they said that they wouldn't consider anything that was less than eight hours in length. So, uh, and, and just in case anyone's unfamiliar with Audible, it is uh, you know, the largest provider of uh, spoken word book at the moment. So any, anyway, that, that aside, I noticed that uh, 
PC, I don't know what PC stands for, uh, whether you're just PC or just uh, not, but PC, you had a question. I don't know if it's been answered, um, but would you like to ask it? Hello, PC. I can see you, but you've got to unmute yourself. Do you, do you want me to ask it for you? Maybe, maybe uh, I'm not making much sense. Anyway, so PC asks, do you compose sound walks with maps and specific sound marks beforehand? So I'm not sure who it was aimed at, uh, but um, has anyone got uh, any answers to that? How, when, 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 I mean, for example, um, John, <laughs> uh, you know, do you, do, you, do you have a map beforehand? Um, you know, you know what you're going to plot out. And uh... um, I mean, the thing is, is like I, I don't, I don't use a map, or I don't look for any specific sound marks. I certainly didn't with Unseen. Uh, I mean, I have, um, I have created pieces, where pieces uh, which aren't necessarily sound walks, but are constant, which are narratives with uh, within within which sound and the sonosphere does play a role. Uh, but I wouldn't like, uh, I, I don't need to look at a map for that um, to, to like, you know, specifically plot places, specific places, unless, you know, I was really wanting to kind of delve into, let's say the, the, the geography of a place and where different sounds or like, uh, where I can hear different sounds in different places and make, do a kind of compare and contrast. Uh, uh, exactly, as uh, Preeta just wrote, uh, Stéphane Marin uh, actually does a really good job of doing that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, but there's no kind of like mapping involved uh, in in that in that respect. I try to keep it kind of keep, make keep it keep it uh, free in that respect. Um, I don't need a map. I don't know if that answers your question. Probably <laughs> not, but um, it's an answer uh, of sorts. Thank you. Yes, it did. Oh, okay. I was I, sorry. I, I, I'm obviously PC. I didn't realise that. Yeah, I was just, I was just um, interested in whether anybody composes a, a walk as a piece of music via maps and sound marks. Um, That's a really good idea. I think I might do that actually. <laughs> I'm trying, honestly. I'm trying. Um, yeah, that's all I was yeah, asking good. about. Is that what you're? Is that what you're doing? Yeah, I'm, I am. Yeah, I'm trying to make it coherent, but uh... I wouldn't worry about making it coherent. <laughs> I would just make it sound good. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in acoustic ecology and uh, highlighting the actual quality of the soundscape itself in order to sure. focus on the, uh, the the health of the ecosystem. So that's all a bit highfalutin, but uh, no, I love that, it. That, that was the way I was approaching it. Anyway, thanks for asking. Thanks for answering. Uh, well, well, I was going to say I know that um, um, I know from doing a little bit of research. Andy, you, you've got a musical background somewhere back there, haven't you? And uh, uh, and and Jeremy, you you mentioned that you've worked a lot with classical music programs and things. So, uh, um, is there something about composition when it comes to thinking about the the slow radio? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, um, I think, uh, yes, I approach making radio programs as if I was writing a piece of music, um, and yeah, it's about it's about structure and pace and dynamics and texture, isn't it? Um, it's exact. I, I approach it exactly the same way as writing a piece of music. Um, and you know you're you're using other people's music, but you're you're weaving different things in. That, that, but but you know I wouldn't go out, I wouldn't compose it or pre-compose it in, in a way. Um, but it's sort of a, yeah, it's a similar sort of thing I think. And um, yeah, and I, I suppose um, my role in this has probably been more in a kind of uh, in terms of. Uh, creatively was in the post-production stage and it's it's just simply a case of uh, doing my work listening back and thinking does this produce um, you know the emotional response that it th that it that it needs to um, really so in that sense it is a lot like working um, 
with something that is just purely uh, music. It's just about how does it make you feel? Um, is that interesting? Um, and, um, you know, if it is, you've probably done your job. Um, okay, so, um, um, yeah, go ahead, Andy. Yeah. I know, I, I, I was just, I wanted to ask Martin about his imaginary islands. Uh, well, exactly. I was going to say it's now time to get the panelists to ask each other if they've got a question out of it. So, yeah, Andy, please go ahead. Okay, Martin, over to you. <laughs> um, the imaginary islands, uh, I have two imaginary islands. Um, so, um, given the fact that my practice is based around walking um, and there is an issue about trying to reflect a human scale of endeavour within what I present, then islands offer a, um, a, uh, a, a very manageable, um, contained space within which to work. And I made a piece of work on um, Fair Isle, which for those of you who know it, is a very small island between Shetland and Orkney, and about halfway between. Um, and I took the idea and applied it to the county in which I live. And in reenacting the second work, I realized that I was actually spending more time in the car, driving from the start of one walk to the start of the next. And so, and that very definitely wasn't what I wanted to do. So I then uh, shrank the scale and created a space which by virtue of my walking within it and the roots and the edges that I produced as I walked turned into an island. Uh, there was a place where I was and I was within it and I didn't go out with it. And interestingly, it's not that far different in size to Fair Isle. Um, and that's uh, so in, in doing that, that's saying something about my physical capacity, both as a human being, but also as a walker. And the second island came about in a not dissimilar manner, um, but came about during the first six weeks of the COVID-19 lockdown, where daily exercise was constrained, though it was never formally constrained, but I recorded a walk every day for 42 days, the first six weeks of the strict period of lockdown. And uh, I imposed a limit of um, both time and distance uh, from my home, which is where I was starting out from. And that produced another island. Uh, interestingly, I, it wasn't a circle, it was nothing like a circle. Um, it had, um, uh, it ended up having beaches and cliffs and hills and valleys and rivers. Um, and um, started to assume an identity of its own. And it, I mean, it goes without saying, I mean, it, it obviously isn't an island, it's in the middle of Newcastle. Um, but the um, motif of the island, taking some of the literary connotations of islands as either places of paradise or places of terror and abandonment, um, it offers a very useful um, artistic device for me to be able to think about how I can approach making work when I go somewhere. So it has many, many advantages. Andy, do you want to come back on that, or is, are you? Um, so what what do the works actually sound like? Um, is it is it? Do you say anything, or or 
does um or is it just the sounds of um of what you're hearing as you walk around and how how does that how how do these kind of become a work they there isn't usually speech um though that is not um uh, absolute and so for instance the lockdown piece has conversation in it um, the um if they're when when they're installed in a space so i would take say the farrell piece and use that as an example that's been installed as a four channel piece in a way that um certain of the walks play through certain of the speakers and so as a listener you can approach a speaker listen into that particular speaker uh, focus on what you're hearing there to actually move to another speaker you have to replicate my act of walking so this idea of co-creation both of the physical movement but also of what you're hearing because a listener can choose to move in any way they wish around the space. So it's interesting hearing you and Jeremy describe the work you produce. I am amazingly light on any sense of narrative. Narrative isn't generally something that I think about. And hearing you talk about um, structure, pace and dynamics, I are much more likely to be using methods of random sequencing from John Cage as I am to be thinking about what sort of narrative am I trying to tell here. And it's, um, so it's fascinating to think, well, okay, how would I do it differently if I was going to try and do that? And some of the repeated walks where Basically what I do is I make a walk along the same route um, once every three hours over a period of 24 hours. So I walk for the whole day um, and um, uh, I produce eight recordings. And um, there, there is a narrative progression through the day. And that's apparent sonically. And it's also apparent through the accompanying poetry. And that's the place where spoken word enters into the recording. So I will read the poetry inside the um, section of the walk to which it, it, it refers. But that's probably the closest I get to anything that you would recognize as narrative. The pieces are deliberately quite open, um, even um, blank and provide a contemplative space for people to imaginatively make their own walk inside their own head. Um, those are the sort of things that I think I'm doing, <laughs> whether or not that's what people are actually experiencing is a completely different matter. Okay. Righto, so where we're at is we're pretty close to the time when we uh, have to wrap this up. So uh, there are two or three, maybe four people who haven't asked a question, haven't spoken. So I just want to make sure that if you haven't spoken or haven't posted a question, that if you would like to do something, you want to get your word in now. Um, uh, what I'm going to uh, offer is I'm going to offer the uh, panelists one last uh, uh, comment, uh, provoca provocation, question they might pose, which they we won't answer. We'll just leave it as a hanging question or a hanging comment or a hanging opinion. But first of all, if, if anyone else who's uh, uh, in the room who hasn't had a chance to say anything or ask a question in the chat, now's your chance. I'm going to do a sort of, uh, the, you know, a plug for what's happening next with Soundwalk September. There are uh, quite a lot of things going on over the weekend. We, we because of the pandemic, we put on a few of, uh, events ourselves, um, of which this is one. 
um, and, and all there are a dozen we've put on, uh, but there are actually over 40 events, so there are many other people contributing. Uh, so please look at the uh, uh, Walk, Listen, Create site for Soundwalk September events, and uh, you'll find there are quite a few different things happening uh, over this weekend and in the uh, following week. Uh, so please do have a look at those and sign up to what you can do. Um, what we'd um, love to uh, have is to have everyone in the room um, actually go out and make a sound walk and post it on 30 Days of Walking. Uh, 30 Days of Walking is uh, one of our um, collaborative efforts to create uh, citizen source slow radio. So um, Babak created the, the site. It's uh, uh, really simple. You just uh, tell us when you're going to go for a walk uh, so that we have a chance to chase you haven't, if you haven't uploaded anything. Uh, we don't, uh, we're not putting you under pressure. You don't have to produce the most fantastic piece of uh, recording uh, unless you really want to. Uh, we want an, anything from a couple of minutes to 20 minutes, and you can post it on 30 days of walking. Uh, and if you go and have a look at 30 Days of Walking on the Walk, Listen, and Create site, you'll find that uh, uh, already there are quite a few people who've had a go at this, so, so do uh, add to it. We also have another one which is called Shorelines, uh, which is an invitation for you to write um, something, uh, 250 words or fewer, uh, poem or prose, fiction, non-fiction, whatever you wish. Um, and then invite someone else to read it. And once again, Babax created it so that you can actually record directly from your computer that you're sitting at. Um, so uh, we want to try and encourage people to recite or read uh, aloud other people's work. And the plan is eventually that we'll start to geolocate that work. So uh, um, just an interesting way to try to get people to collaborate at a time when uh, pandemic, lockdown, or whatever, makes it quite difficult for people to get out and about and uh, in groups. So those are the things coming up. Now, uh, you've had a chance. Anyone who's still in the room hasn't asked a question, wants to ask a question? Just unmute yourself and say, oh, I've, I've got a question. If not, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up with um, Giving the panelists, uh, you, you each have a chance now. You just uh, give us an opinion, a comment, a question, something you want us to think about, and, and maybe follow up in the comment section of uh, for this event. So, um, John, you went first, so uh, you can go first again. So, uh, your, your last oh, point. That's, that's, uh, that's very kind. Well, having listened to uh, everyone, this has actually been really inspiring. and. Uh, one thing, like uh, I do, you know, with with the sound walking that I have done, which has been basically, you know, fact based, uh, fact based, um, you know, informative um, episodes um, about places which you can't see. Uh, I've, i the things what I really would like to work on uh, are actually places, uh, much like uh, also what Prita was saying, like places. Um, which simply don't exist, and maybe you know, creating your own kind of uh, place to walk around through the medium of sound. Um, so yeah, uh, and that's basically just something I just wanted to throw out there. It's it's getting pretty late here in Poland, so um, I think I should just better stop talking. Many thanks to everyone. Uh, uh, Martin, uh, I think my question to everyone um, after I have said thank you all for your contributions. I've really, really enjoyed being part of the panel. Uh, and I agree with John, it's been an inspiring conversation. My question to you is, where is your imaginary island? That's great. OK, uh, Jeremy. Uh, I, I've been struck by uh, by what Martin's been saying, particularly, and the uh, similarities and differences in in what we do, and and that that thing about narrative, and you know, I question why we're we're so tied up in it. I think it's perhaps because you know, for years we've been making radio programs that are constricted by time, but we are still trying to take our listeners to that imaginary place and create those pictures in their minds and give them space. Um, 
and that's that's what I hope we can all continue to do. Um, Andy, you have the last word from the panel. All right. Well, um, the I, the only thing that has occurred to me is just how um, how personal these works are. Uh, the work that we did, but also Martin, you're not hearing the place um, simply. You're hearing it filtered in all sorts of different ways through the person who's made that work and thinking back and listening back for the first time for quite a long time to what we did that has really struck me now it tells our story of that place i have no idea how much it says about that place um but maybe that's what the sound walk experience was for me it was that interfacing of the sort of actual uh and the personal and as a medium I find that um, interesting. Hope to do more work in it in the future. Great. Well, look, that's terrific. Thank you very much to all of you. Um, for everyone in the room who's contributed in some way, especially to the panelists, um, what I want to make sure of is that before people leave this uh, event, that you download the chat if you want it. And if uh, that's really handy because there are lots of URLs and suggestions in there. And you do that by going to the three dots at the bottom of the chat um, frame and you can download the chat from there. We will encourage you to uh, continue the conversation or discussion on the comments on the events page. Um, so uh, that would be something that would be great. We'll be sending you a, an email to ask for some feedback from you as well. And obviously what we would love you to do is go out and use the Echoes app, uh, because we want to thank Echoes for being our sponsor for this event and um, have a go and play with it. It's a free, uh, a free app which allows you to geolocate uh, sounds and create a walk very quickly. But please uh, keep safe and well. Keep signing up for uh, Soundwalk September events. Um, and thank you very much for being involved. Fantastic.